Hi guys, welcome to today's class. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to take um, a closer look at some fabrics and we're actually going to continue this for the next few lessons. So we just completed our first uh, critique and it went really well. I had such a great time looking at all your guys' great work. Um, you did such a wonderful job. Um, I can't wait for the next one. Um, and again, there will be another one. Uh, so look up on the assignments page. Uh, the assignment will be up by the end of today. Uh, today is Thursday, the, uh, April 30th. So take a look at your assignments to check to see when the next collection project will be due. Um, it will be due in about a couple weeks. So just take a look to see uh, the exact parameters and when it's due. Um, it will, of course, be the exact same project. So five uh, final looks, uh, 15 thumbnails, mood and fabric board, and flats. Um, so exact same project. Uh, just the only thing I'm looking for, since this is the exact same project all over again, I want to see some improvement uh, from each and every one of you. Um, so hopefully you had a good idea from the critique, uh, what you did really well and what you need to improve on and what you need to do to uh, achieve that. Um, overall as well, um, I'm sort of doing this fabrics because overall, um, the fabric knowledge on the fabrics that you guys used was, was pretty weak, pretty, pretty much across the board. Um, and again, it's really important for us as fashion designers to know our fabrics. Um, it's one of the most important knowledge bases that we have. Remember, everything we make, we make out of fabric. And if we don't know what we're making it out of, um, how can we possibly call ourselves competent designers? So I like to sort of use the analogy of um, a restaurant. So if you go into the restaurant and the chef has created a menu and you look on the menu and the menu says meat and you say well I don't know if I just want to order random strange meat what kind of meat is it and the chef goes well I don't know but it's meat and you say oh I think it's time to go to a new restaurant okay that's the same thing uh, when you guys bring up your fabric boards and there's something that says cotton on it what kind of cotton? You're not even saying if it's knit or woven. And, and again, uh, because of the circumstances, we're really limited in being able to go out and get physical swatches. So being able to use physical swatches um, sort of solves a lot of these problems because we can feel it, we can look at it. Um, but when you're just using an image, you really need to lay out every single thing about that fabric because we can't touch it, we can't look at it, we don't know pretty much anything except for the color, um, uh, which is in your swatch. So again, when you pull up your fabric, or even if you do have a swatch and you say to whomever it is, you know, someone that you are trying to, you know, impress to get a job or a client or anybody else, and you say, this fabric that I used is cotton and you leave it at that, you are advertising to the world that, hey, I do not know anything about fabrics. And since you don't know anything about fabrics, it is very unlikely that you are a competent designer. It is so, so, so important to know your fabrics. And again, I don't care if you can draw super well, uh, I don't care if you can do your flat super well, I don't care if you put together colors super well, if you let it slip that you don't know your fabrics, um, it, you just you do, can never look like a competent designer. Um, and it's so important because each fabric has its own properties, its own characteristics, and really is suited for certain types of garments. Sometimes it can, it can really make or break the construction of a garment. Um, and of course, that's what we're making. We're not just making sketches of designs. We're not just making little presentations and things like that. In the actual fashion industry, we are making fab uh, garments and they are made out of fabrics. Um, another example is, you know, uh, why would you want a carpenter that doesn't know anything about wood? You can go ask a carpenter, you know, you're interviewing two carpenters because you want some new cabinets or whatever. And you ask one of them, what kind of wood do you think would look great or work well in your, um, you know, situation. And one goes, oh, I don't know, the wood kind of wood. And you go, oh man, I don't think this guy knows anything. He says the wood type of wood. You go to the other one, he goes, 
oh, well, you need a nicely fine-aged cherry because it uh, is very strong, it has a beautiful color, it's very durable, it's, it's going to smell quite... And he knows all the different properties of this, this wood and other different kinds of wood, and it, it helps you make a selection of what's going to go perfectly for you and, and work well for this project. Um, it's the same for us. We, as designers, need to know about our fabrics because it is the most important ingredient, um, sometimes the only ingredient, in our garments. And if we pick the wrong fabric, I don't care if it was designed beautifully, I don't care if that design was drawn with the most gorgeous hand and the most beautiful illustration, I don't care if the flat was perfect, if you just pick the wrong fabric because you don't know anything about fabrics, it is not going to be a successful garment. It is either not going to do what you need it to do, um, it's not going to perform the way you need it to perform, it's not going to look the way you want it to look, and the customer is not going to like it. And again, the more you know about fabrics, the better you can navigate the world of fabric sourcing, which of course is absolutely vital to the designer. Um, it's our ingredients, our raw ingredients. So again, you don't want to go into that restaurant where it's serving vegetable and meat. And of course, you guys, you know, I love when I ask you guys a little bit something more about your fabric when you just say cotton. You say, oh, it's a blue cotton. It's the same thing again as going into the restaurant and looking at the menu and seeing vegetable. And you ask the waiter, well, what kind of vegetable? He goes, oh, it's a green vegetable. You know, oh, great, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. Um, uh, same thing with you. So I don't wanna hear, I don't wanna see vegetable and meat on the menu. I don't wanna see cotton or uh, wool on your fabric boards. Instead, when I open up that menu, I want to see that I have a, you know, center cut prime filet cooked at a medium rare with uh, over a, a beautiful bed of greens and the balsamic vinaigrette reduction sauce drizzled on top. Sell it to me. That's what I want to eat. I don't want to eat meat. I want to eat that other thing. Same with our fabric. I don't want a cotton. I want a plain weave. Um, two-ply mercerized cotton with uh, two-ply yarns, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, with a, you know, like what I said, a plain bit. I want to know everything about it. And again, knowing the names of your fabrics are great, but we have to know also what makes up the fabric. So we're going to look at not only our different types of fabric, but what makes up our different fabrics. And it's, it's not just your fiber, guys. Uh, a spoiler. So we're going to take a look at different types of cotton fabrics today, so let's begin the slideshow. A look at cotton. Okay, so what makes up a fabric? So you guys already know your fibers, so that's only one of the many different things that really make up our fibers or fabrics. And these are just the main things that make up fabrics. There's other al uh, alternative things that can be applied to describe a fabric, but these are just our main sort of four things um, that can describe a fabric. Um, so first, of course, is your fiber. What is the fiber actually made out of? Is it cotton? Is it wool? Is it silk? Um, is it a blend? Uh, what is the blend? Is it 50 cotton, 50 poly? Is it, um, uh, you know, uh, 95 cotton, 5 spandex? What is it? The next is the yarn type. And the yarn type describes how the actual yarns are made. Um, is it tightly twisted? Is it, is it loosely twisted? Is it plied? Uh, is it a particular type of specialty yarn, like a crepe yarn or a chenille yarn? Um, uh, what, what is special about your yarn types? Uh, the next is weave, and again, this sort of goes for woven fabrics, but of course, if you're working with a knit, what, what is the knit pattern? Um, oh, and back to the yarn type. Is it a big yarn? Is it a, is it a small yarn? Is it a fine yarn? Uh, so weave type uh, for woven fabrics, of course. Is it a plain weave? Is it a twill weave? Is it a variation of a weave? Is it, or like a basket weave or a semi-basket weave? Um, is it a, you know, variation of a twill weave, like is it a herringbone weave, or is it a houndstooth check, um, or uh, again, if it's a knit, what kind of knit stitches are used? Is it your plain knit? Is it a stockingette knit? Are there specialty knit patterns like a rib or a cable or uh, anything else like that, a seed stitch? Um, um, so 
how is it woven if it's a woven? How is it knit if it's knit? Um, and then, of course, finish. So we have a variety of different finish types for different fabrics, it, fabrics that achieve uh, different properties for our fabrics. So we're going to go over some of those finishes today. Now, not all fabrics have a finish, but a lot of them do. Um, and again, that is typically done either after a garment is created or more likely after the uh, fabric is created. But sometimes um, it's finished a, a particular process of chemical finishing um, or otherwise finishing before the fiber is even spun into a yarn. So every finish is a little bit different, okay? So if you know your fabric, you don't know just fiber or just anything else. You know all of these things and potentially more, okay? So for the next collection project, when you pull out your fabric board and it just says cotton, be prepared for me to ask you What's your yarn type? What are the yarns like? How is it woven? Are there finishes? Um, and again, it's important for you guys to know that. The more you know about fabric, the more competent a designer you are going to look like. And, put and potentially be. <laughs> Hopefully be. Okay, guys. So let's talk about general cotton properties. Um, so this is pretty much our properties that apply across the board to cotton. Uh, it's pretty easy to wash, although it's prone to shrinkage if it's not pre-shrunk. Most fabrics these days go through a pre-shrinking process. So once you either get them in stores or the fabric gets to the uh, garment factory, uh, the fabric has already been washed and shrunk down uh, uh, as much as it's going to. So it's not going to shrink any farther. But sometimes you can get a hold of some uh, fabric that is not pre-shrunk and end up with some pretty disastrous results. For example, I made um, a very comfy pair of sweatpants for my boyfriend one year. I did not pre-wash the fabric. I did not check to see if it was pre-shrunk. And they were very, very lovely. Um, he was very, very comfy in them until I washed them. And they shrunk down about 50%. So now I have, you know, teeny tiny little kids um, uh, <laughs> sweatpants that can't be used. So just just uh, uh, keep an eye out. Most things are pre-washed, but again, especially if you're making things, uh, I would recommend to wash your cottons first or really inquire. But you know, a lot of times at fabric stores, they really have no idea what they're talking about, so I wouldn't even trust them. Wash it before you sew it um, to see if it will shrink. Uh, once it has shrunk a significant amount, it might shrink a little bit more, um, but not necessarily. Um, once you go through a couple washes, it's pretty much shrunk as much as it's going to shrunk in your good. It's a moderately strong fiber. It's resistant to moths and other bugs. They don't like to eat it. Um, it's very absorbent, so that's why we see it in uh, used in towels and robes, um, bath mats, um, as well as you know undergarments because it can wick sweat off of us very well. It's cool and breathable, which again makes it a very comfortable uh, fabric, especially in summertime and in hot weather. Um, it wrinkles very easily, unfortunately. Um, and it's vulnerable to mildew. It's quite vulnerable to mildew. So if it's stored in a location that's kind of hot and moist, um, it will tend to get moldy, um, which is not great. All right. So let's talk about some common weave types. So these, uh, I talked about these a lot at the very beginning of class, our plain weave versus our twill weave. So I'm not gonna get go into it too much because you should remember. But our plain weave is one of, our, uh, probably the most common type of weave and we're gonna see a lot of plain weaves in our cotton wovens. And it just has an over, under, over, under, over, under pattern. So we take each yarn, so we have our wefts and it goes over a corresponding warp, under a corresponding warp, over a corresponding warp, under. So over, under, over, under. And then the warps, of course, do the same thing over their corresponding wefts. Of course, the warps being our long yarns and the wefts being our crosswise yarns. A twill weave is slightly different. A twill weave has a uh, weft pattern that goes over two, under one. Oh, this is an over two. Okay, so it's a slightly different weave uh, uh, twill pattern, but um, it's it's still a twill pattern. It actually has a, it's a, it's a dual twill. So it has the same um, uh, going on in both the warp and weft, uh, which can produce a kind of, um, it's like a checky pattern, but um, long story short with our twills, uh, we have at least a warp or a weft yarn going over two and uh, typically under one. 
So this is going over two under one, and then the pattern is staggered. staggered. Um, actually, that's a mistake. I wanted to do a, a slightly more standard twill weave design. This is a, a slight variation on twill weave, but it's the same thing. Uh, all in all, end of the day, what you need to do is there's a variation of an over two pattern, staggered. Um, the most important part is that you get this sort of diagonal ribbing for the twill. We're going to talk about twills a little bit later in our twill section. Um, but again, twill is our strongest weave, um, and you get this sort of, because of the weave pattern, you get this sort of subtle diagonal ribbing along your uh, fabric face. Not always on the back, but always on the face. All right, let's talk about mercerized cotton. Mercerized is a very popular finish for cotton. Not all cotton is mercerized, but plenty of it is, and especially a lot of the cottons in our, our first section. So our first section of uh, fa cotton fabrics is going to be shirting fabrics. A lot of shirting fabrics has have the mercerized finish. So what is it? So this process was devised uh, quite a long time ago, at about 1844, by a guy named John Mercer, who else, um, who treated cotton with solutions of about 20 to 30 percent sodium hydroxide. Um, and following, followed by a washing, so you get all that out. You don't want that lingering on your fabric. And um, once he did that, Mercer observed that the treated fabric shrank. So this is a method of pre-shrinking your fabric. It had increased tensile strength. That means it's stronger and more durable. And had an increased affinity for dyes. So it was able to take dyes easier and produce brighter, more vibrant colors. Today, most high-end cotton is mercerized, and the process has improved. It is improved, so all of these things that it did before, it does it better, it makes it stronger, makes uh, dyes take to a brighter colors, um, it, it shrinks it to a more final state, but it also, uh, uh, this process now adds a shiny luster to cotton fabrics in addition to its previous benefits. And the mercerization process, um, uh, it can pretty much go from kind of a dull sheen to kind of a pretty shiny luster. Um, and again, that just depends on what you want out of your fabric. Um, and again, that mercerization process can be, uh, or that shiny luster due to the mercerization process can be accented by the satin weave, but we're not even gonna get to the satin weave today. Okay, shirting fabrics. So the term shirting fabrics refers to a large group of usually cotton woven fabrics that are typically used to make collared button-down shirts, hence the name shirting fabrics. They can be used to make anything else that you so desire, though. They're just traditionally used to make these, again, hence the name, and they are in a category of usually plain weave, uh, usually kind of lightweight, to at most a sort of light medium weight uh, fabric. Uh, again, a lot of them are mercerized um, to add to a, the sort of smoothness to it, to the quality. They're typically made out of the highest quality uh, of cottons that we'll have, so a very fine cotton shirt. Um, again, sort of collared shirts tend to be a more formal, higher-end uh, garment, so again, we'll use higher-end cottons. You might say, what's your higher-end cotton? Well, we talk to the, about things like Pima cottons, or Egyptian cottons, or sea breeze cottons. Uh, these are uh, types of very high quality cottons um, that we'll use in high quality cotton wovens. Now, sometimes um, these fabrics aren't 100% cotton. Very, very commonly um, at lower price points, we'll create these fabrics by blending in polyester. Our first shirting fabric uh, is broadcloth. So broadcloth is a plain weave fabric that has fine, closely woven yarns. The weft yarns of a broadcloth are slightly heavier and have less twist than the lengthwise warp yarns. Uh, this gives a subtle crosswise ribbing effect. So you get sort of, you can kind of see here in, this, in, this, in the close up, uh, you can see these sort of crosswise patterns going in. And it's very, very subtle. It's not very thick or super noticeable, but if you put your eyes real close, you can kind of see a uh, more prominent sort of crosswise ribbing texture than you can in lengthwise. Originally, the name of the fabric came from its being sold in wider than normal widths, but today you can get broadcloth in most any widths. Um, however, I get upset if I get a broadcloth in an air width because it's against its name. 
Uh, rotten cloth is a, typically a lightweight shirting fabric, usually from mercerized cotton. It's very, very similar to poplin, which we're going to visit later on, um, but it's typically lighter in weight than poplin. Chambray. Chambray is a soft, comfortable shirting fabric with a plain weave. We can see that plain weave right here. Um, it is characterized by having colored warp yarns and white weft yarns. So chambray is typically blue, but it can be other colors in, uh, as well. And you can see this sort of blending of colors. So we have the, you can see that blue in uh, the warp yarns and that white in the weft yarns. Um, and again, that kind of gives it almost, when you zoom out, a little bit of a weathered feel. It looks like the color, but maybe a little bit pastel or a little bit weathered. Um, Chambray doesn't need to have this, but I've also found that it typically has um, a slightly sort of thicker, less tightly spun yarns, which makes it a little bit softer. So um, when your yarns are spun a little bit more loosely, you tend to get a kind of limper, softer fabric. Um, if yarns are spun very, very tightly, you tend to get a, um, a, a, a stiffer fabric. Okay, there's our chambray. Next, we have Oxford cloth. So Oxford cloth is used, uh, is made with a semi-basket weave. Now, a basket weave is a variation on our plain weave, and we'll visit that a little bit more in depth later on when we look at weave variations. But pretty much a semi-basket weave means two thinner warp yarns are grouped and woven against one thicker weft yarn. Really the basket weave just means two thin, uh, two warp yarns against one weft, um, but the Oxford cloth has the distinct characteristic of those uh, warp yarns being thinner than a thicker weft yarn. Oxford cloth can uh, uh, be made with mercerized cotton and come in many co colors, although it's often white. My example's not white, so you can see a little bit better those thin, tiny um, uh, warp yarns against that thicker um, weft yarn. You can zoom in even more, you can see, so there's the little blue, the little blue checks are actually two tiny yarns uh, together that act as one woven uh, against, again, that uh, thicker weft yarn. Poplin. So poplin, again, is very similar to broadcloth and has the same construction of having slightly heavier weft yarns that create a crosswise ribbing effect. However, poplin is a heavier weight fabric than broadcloth, but um, by no means a heavyweight fabric. Um, it can come in uh, uh, weights so really kind of medium, medium light to kind of medium heavy. I wouldn't classify a very heavy uh, uh, poplin as, as a true poplin, but I guess you can have it. Um, the medium weight poplins are used to make shirts. The medium to lightweight poplins, poplins can make shirt, but heavier weights you can use to make outerwear. Uh, kind of light, I wouldn't use it as like a winter coat. Of course, cotton's not very insulative. It's not warm, it's a cool fabric. So, you know, your spring or summer um, outerwear. Uh, poplin is one of the most common plain weave, uh, we weaves available, and again, so it comes in many different weights and many different colors. And it also can be mercerized for a nice subtle shine, or heavily mer have a hot, great mercerization for a uh, bigger shine. Okay, while we're in this category of uh, shorting fabrics, we sort of rounded out our types, but this is a good time to talk about thread count. So thread count is very important when we talk about our, our cotton wovens, um, and thread count refers to the number of warp and weft yarns in a given square space. Uh, we've probably seen it in advertising for bed fabrics and things like that. Get these sheets, there are a million billion thread counts or whatever else. Um, but it is always used when designers are ordering fabrics for mills. So when you are a designer and you are seriously ordering fabrics and things like that, um, the thread count is, is very important. Things are going to be advertised and sold and specified by thread count. Um, so the image on the right shows how to find the thread count for a, a fabric with a single ply of yarn. And I'm going to explain what the single ply yarn has to do with it in the next slide. But pretty much, so this would be per inch, and again, depending on the um, measurement units of the country that you're in, it might be the centimeter, inch, whatever. We use inches here. Um, so basically we say, okay, there's a hundred warp yarns in this inch and there's a hundred 
weft yarns in this inch. So in the square inch, there's 200 individual threads uh, or yarns. Thread and yarns are used interchangeably here. Uh, that means that this fabric that it's representing has a 200 uh, uh, thread count per inch. Okay? Now this can change depending on your plies. Okay, so what is applied yarn? Now this uh, has to do with your types of yarns. So sometimes yarns can be single, which means they're just spun straight from the uh, fiber into the yarn. But sometimes yarns are then spun again amongst themselves. And this image up here is showing a three-ply yarn. So th um, three single-ply yarns are being spun together to create a three-plied yarns. And again, Applied yarns are multiple yarns that are spun together and act as one yarn when the uh, fabric is woven. Um, again, so for example, a two-ply fabric uh, uses a uh, warp and weft yarn that have two finer yarns spun together. A four-ply yarn is a yarn with four finer yarns spun together to create one yarn. This method can increase the thread count of a fabric. Okay, so sometimes uh, it, when they're being sold, like given an advertisement for bed cloths, they'll use a plied yarn to increase the thread count. So here we have um, an example of uh, a thread count at 300, uh, where it has you know 150 warp and 150 weft yarns, creating of course um, a 300 ply thread count, 150 plus 150 um, uh, in that inch or whatever. It doesn't say unit, but let's just assume it's an inch. Uh, gives you a 300 uh, uh, single ply thread count. Uh, and a lot of times that would be notated as 150 times 1, 150 uh, uh, 1. So the, um, in, if, if you're actually buying from a mill, the ply and thread count is noted in the uh, uh, fabric description. Um, here we have a three ply thread count. So each one of these guys actually has three finer yarns spun together. And in this instance, uh, they have used that to increase their thread count. So it's the same amount of threads, but each one of these threads, each one of these 150 warp and 150 weft, have three in it. So it's that original thread count times three. So we're actually getting 900 in, uh, uh, threads per inch here. So again, that's how we can um, increase our thread count. And you might say, well, why would you bother to do a plied yarn? Well, plied yarns have different um, characteristics. They can give you a, a nice, denser fabric. Um, our fine yarns tend to be kind of nice and smooth and have a nice sheen, as opposed to our looser, uh, kind of thicker yarns. But if you want a dense fabric that's smooth with sheen, um, uh, again, you have to make it out of very fine, tightly spun yarns. So what you would have to do is spin them all together um, to create applied fabric. Uh, when we get to things like silk, uh, there's uh, applied yarns with silk that have a, a just a gorgeous body drape and fluidity to them. Um, and again, you get this sort of density uh, of the fabric that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Whew, all right, stripes, plaids, and checks. Um, this category I'm, I'm putting into cottons, although it certainly applies to uh, especially wools and silks and everything else, but I'm just sort of putting it in here. Again, it goes very well alongside our uh, shirting fabrics. A lot of times our shirting fabrics have a stripe check or plaid pattern with them. And here we have just little examples. So yarn dyed stripes or plaids. So most cotton woven stripes or plaids are created with what's called a yarn dyed process. This means that prior to weaving the fabric, the yarns are dyed, whatever their intended colors are going to be. The dyed yarns are then arranged in the loom um, uh, and the weaving process will create the stripe or plaid pattern. And you can see that here. So this is a really great example of a yarn dyed stripe. You can see very easily that the yarns themselves are dyed and they're just arranged. So we have four, like, it looks like um, four blue yarns uh, in our warp are set next to four white yarns in our warp and this, so on and so forth that is repeated 
Our fill or weft is just completely white, so you can see that sort of blending into our blue stripes here. Um, and again, that is what will happen. So whenever we use a yarn dye um, uh, method, uh, our colors are going to be slightly blended with whatever is coming um, through it. So it's, it's really never just one color, it's two colors coming together. Um, and you can see that very easily in uh, plaid patterns. Let's go back here. So you can see, you know, here's the green stripe. When the green stripe and the green stripe intersect, it's a really bright green. But when it's intersecting with the red stripe, it's kind of this blended, kind of muted, um, but not really red, not really green color, kind of just sort of dark. Um, and that's what creates that sort of, you know, um, changing between sort of more muted colors and bright colors at the intersections of our um, plaids here. Most stripes that you will see and plaids, uh, plaids in cotton wovens do use a yarn dye method. It's very, very common, very, very popular. And it's very handy too. So when you are using a yarn dyed stripe or plaid, um, uh, just as a, a, a seamstress myself, I, I tend to kind of like it better um, because it, it lets you see the grain exactly. So because the yarns themselves are creating the stripes, they're beautiful indicators of which way the grain is going. So you always have that nice clear representation. Printed stripes or plaids. So if your stripe or plaid is not woven in by a yarn dyed method, um, the fabric is woven already and then the stripe or plaid pattern is printed on top of it. Um, this will create sort of more vibrant um, stripe colors. So again, you don't have that instance where your weft or warp is blending in and sort of blurring the color a little bit or influencing the color. You can have bright, solid colors with nothing else uh, influencing it uh, since you print it just straight on top of it. Uh, however, you lose that ability to look at where the grain is. Um, and a lot of times if it is, you have a stripe that is not printed properly onto the fabric, it can cause a lot of trouble. Because if it's not printed properly, that means the stripe itself will be slightly off grain. Uh, and, but of course, if you're making a shirt or a skirt or something, you want those stripes to be nice straight up and down. But that means sacrificing your grain direction, which can make it fall kind of wonky. Um, so beware of that. If you are picking up a printed stripe or a printed plaid, uh, make sure it's printed properly and is matching the grain as closely as it can be. Tartans. So tartans uh, pretty much is a, a Scottish word for plaid, but a specific type of plaid. Um, tartans are original to Scottish textiles. They are a woven yarn dyed plaid with very specifically a symmetrical repeating pattern. Uh, to be a true tartan, it must have a symmetrical repeating pattern. If not, it's not a true tartan. Um, and originally will come with a, sort of a, a specific range of colors, but we see all different colors today. So they're an ancient style of uh, plaid, and originally every family clan in Scotland had their own tartan design, and they would use that to make the kilts for their family and uh, clothing for them. So they'd have their own clan tartan. And you actually can still go up, uh, there's certain databases on the internet where you can look up, um, if you have any sort of Scottish heritage, look up your family name and, and find your clan uh, tartan. Uh, there's even books they sell that, you, you know, libraries of tartan plan uh, uh, designs and things like that. Um, so uh, I don't know if any, I'm not Scottish, I don't know if anybody is, but if you know anyone that is Scottish, or uh, you can go ahead and, and look up your clan tartan. Madras. Madras is in, uh, traditionally uh, an Indian fabric uh, with a checked or plaid pattern. So true madras is woven with a plain weave with cotton yarns that have been dyed using vegetable dyes. Uh, this fabric, so that what happens is they uh, will dye the yarns in sort of a wet vat. Um, and then while the yarns are still wet, they'll weave the fabric. So the colors will tend to sort of bleed together and kind of result in kind of a muted, sort of soft blended color. Uh, today, typically chemical dyes are used, 
uh, but we still try to get that sort of soft, muted, slightly blended color uh, uh, feel within our Madras fabrics. And again, there's many different styles and uh, many different patterns available. Checks. So checks um, are pretty much, they refer to a plaid pattern that only uses two colors and the vertical and horizontal stripes are the same size. Kind of like a checkerboard. Not exactly a checkerboard, but kind of like it. So again, our stripe, uh, so we see all the little stripes here are all the same size. All the little box or whatever are uh, the same size. And we're really only using two colors. Now it kind of looks like three, a black, a gray, and a white, but this is because this is yarn dyed. So really we only have a black stripe coming through on the dark stripes and it only looks gray because it, again it's getting blended in with the white stripe here because this is uh, oh, oh, woven uh, and yarn dyed. So um, basically our black threads and our lighter threads are blending in here to create a slightly lighter color. Buffalo check. So a buffalo check refers to a check pattern with a wide stripes. It's typically a red and black check pattern, uh, but I have seen the name used with different colorways. Um, for me personally, uh, a buffalo check is always red and black, uh, but some people might disagree with me. Um, but it's, uh, it's this typical sort of check pattern, typically with, again, a wider stripe um, uh, and uh, uh, usually a, a red and black check pattern. So it would look exactly like this. And just a very specific buffalo check. It's used a lot of times in shirts um, with flannel fabrics. Um, I'm going to explain this a little bit more when I get to flannel fabrics, but since I'm on the plaid, flannel does not refer to a plaid or checked pattern. That is one of the most commonly made mistakes in uh, when people refer to fabrics. Flannel does not in any way indicate a check or plaid pattern. Um, if you say, oh, this, is a, this is, looks like a flannel fabric, you don't know it's a flannel fabric. Why don't you know it's a flannel fabric? Well, you don't know it's finish. Well, flannel uh, uh, is only uh, specific to a type of finish. And we'll get to that when we get to, when we get to it. Okay, gingham. Uh, gingham is another very popular uh, check pattern with a little bit less restriction than our buffalo check. It's typically made out of a lightweight plain leaf uh, cotton, although it can be made out of different uh, uh, fibers as well. Uh, it has a yarn dyed check pattern, and this pattern uh, alternates a colored stripe with a white uh, color. Um, pretty much for gingham, you will typically see it in a little bit lighter colors. It's typically kind of pastel-y, but you can have dark colors as well, just so long, again, as it, it adheres to the check rules of uh, being equal size stripes and having an alternating white and colored stripe. They can pretty much be anything. So um, that refers to a very large group of checks. Um, uh, and again, the, the stripe size can be small, um, or it can be large as well. So you're really just looking for a check that has a colored stripe and alternates with a white stripe. And you got gingham. Again, though, a gingham usually refers to a cotton fabric as well. Okay, let's get into some twill cottons. The twill weave is the strongest of the fabric weave types. And it is used to create strong, durable fabrics that are usually a bit heavier in weight than our plain weaves. Let's take a look at some of our common uh, cotton twills. We're going to start off with chino. So chino is a very common cotton twill. It is often made with two-ply yarns, and you know what that means now. Uh, often with mercerized cotton, and you know what that means, so it has a dull sheen to it. Uh, chino can also come in many different colors, but its most popular color is tan. And when it does, uh, we often refer to it as khaki. Um, a khaki fabric or a khaki. Uh, khaki is the Hindu word for dust, so it refers to that sort of tan color. Uh, chino is really great for pants and light jackets, and of course we'll always have that distinctive diagonal ribbing from its twill weave. Denim. 
Denim is the most recognizable cotton twill, and it can also be called jean fabric, named after the garment it is most used to make. True denim has a warp yarn dyed indigo blue with white weft yarns. Um, this is always for true for true true denim. However, um, you can see fabrics marketed as denim with other colors. Mm, fine, whatever. Um, however, uh, I would say true denim is always uh, has an indigo blue dye with those white weft white uh, weft yarns in between it. We also have drill. So drill is a very dense, heavyweight twill cotton. It is used to make durable clothing such as uniforms and work clothes. Um, it's very similar to chino, but it tends to be of slightly lesser quality uh, cotton. It tends not to be mercerized, uh, and it tends to be of heavier weight than our chino. Um, but again, you see that, uh, that twill pattern very, very, very uh, apparently on it. Very, very easy to see. And it comes in many, many different colors. Uh, but a lot of times it will also come on uh, dyed as well. So just your sort of natural cotton color. All right, while we're in the sort of category that has denim, I want to talk about denim finishes. So um, all, you will almost never buy a denim garment without a denim finish on it. So again, this is why it's really important. So if any of you guys use a denim in your uh, collection projects from here on out, I want to know what kind of denim finish you use. So denim by itself, um, or what we would call raw or unfinished, is very, very stiff uh, and very, very uncomfortable. Uh, so what we do is we apply any number of different finishes to help soften uh, and treat the denim. And not only does it make it softer and, and more comfortable to wear, but it also can apply different styles and looks on it. So let's take a look at what we see. And again, almost every single denim garment on the market has been finished somehow. It is ne almost never raw. And how can you tell? Well, those little lines here that you see for pockets, see how they're not here? This side is showing a raw or unfinished denim. Here's the finished denim. Um, it, we don't see those lines. We don't see any fading patterns. So sometimes you, you see how the thigh is a little bit lighter or the knee is a little bit lighter than the rest. You don't see that. It's completely even uniform. Uh, this is very stiff. There's no softness. There's no weathering. There's no distressing. There's no um, uh, threads. Here you can see a full sort of distress. So, um, so distress we use is a sort of combination of different finishing elements uh, to create a very weathered used look, very soft. You can see here, even in the belt loop here, it's much softer. It's much softer around here. Um, uh, these pockets, they look like they've been uh, ground or sanded. Um, so people will use a sandpaper or even like specialized angle grinders to go at and they sort of weather them. You can sort of see the, the threads starting to pop out and weather there. None of that's happening here. These sort of crease lines and things like that, they're all on there. And a lot of times the crease lines, uh, and again, they're all uh, kind of inspired by what jeans will look like after you wear them for like 10 years. But we ain't got the time for that. We want it to look the way we want it to look as soon as we buy them. So a lot of that distressing, the sort of crease lines that, again, you would naturally get from creasing the pants and sitting down and standing and walking are just painted on or sanded in um, and are there as soon as we buy them. So let's talk about some of the different finishes that we uh, use for denim. And let's start with a stone wash. So stone wash is very, very, very common. It's probably one of the most common um, uh, um, processes that we, we have. Um, and we can get a, a variety of different outcomes from stone washing, depending on how we do it, uh, how we apply the stone washing, uh, so on and so forth. So as the name indicates, this treatment uses large stones to soften denim fabric before or after the garment has been sewn. The fabric uh, is usually put into a machine that resembles sort of a tumble dryer with these large stones and allows the friction of the stones rubbing on the fabric to soften it. Now if we do it like that, it will tend to look like this. It will kind of have lighter, darker, kind of patchy um, coloring to it. 
Um, we can also just rub stones or pumice stones. A lot of times they're used because they have added friction. If you don't want as much friction, you can use different types of stones, but they'll rub it in certain areas, like right here, to create a lightening, whitening, or softening of the fabric in specific areas. Acid wash. So this is super popular in the 80s and actually has a pretty interesting history to it. If you want to look up to it, it kind of originated with California surfers. Um, but what we do is it's pretty much a stone washing, but we also use a sort of diluted bleach to lighten it. And your typical acid wash denim is, is very, very light, but kind of has darker splotches to it. Um, uh, acid wash then is, is sort of has this, and again, that achieves uh, the softening it needs because of the stone. And um, the acid doesn't really, well, that's it's not really acid, it's bleach. Um, which I don't know, might be an acid, it might be basic too, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's bleach. Um, it doesn't soften it, the stone soften it, it really is more of an aesthetic thing to give you this sort of very um, patchy, light and dark denim look. Um, again, very popular in the 80s and, you know, will come back every so often when people are feeling retro. Sand wash denim. So the sand wash process is very similar to stone washing where sand is rubbed onto the denim to soften it. Uh, sometimes factories will use sandpaper or even like sanders uh, to rub specific parts of the garment to isolate the distressing. And again, we see we a lot of times it's done on sort of pocket edges and in here and on your thighs to sort of simulate jeans that have been worn for a very, very long time. Um, geez, fortunately, this person is super tall, my God. Um, anyway, so we have, you can sand wash other fabrics too. So silk is also a fabric that's very often um, goes through the sand washing process. Um, we'll get to that when we get to the silks. But again, almost every single denim that you have is finished in some way. Um, uh, if you were to really buy a raw or unfinished denim pants, um, they're super, super uncomfortable and they don't, they don't have the sort of crease look, the lighting, the fading, the things that we are really typically associate with uh, uh, jeans and denim. Rinsed wash denim. So this is, um, I said stone wash is most common. This is probably the most common. This is like the bare minimum that you need. So rinsed washing denim is very commonly done and basically you just wash it, rinse it. Um, uh, and again, you can do it um, just a few times or you can do it many, many times. So you can refer to it as a light rinsed or a heavy rinse, depending on how many times you have rinsed it out. And again, um, this just gets rid of excess dye, it appreciates the fabric, it softens the fabric, gives it a slightly uh, more used look, but um, not, not too much. And again, it doesn't have um, the, a lot of the distressing things that we usually see. So if you take a look at these jeans, they were probably medium rinse, so they're a bit softer to wear. Um, um, a, a little bit worn in, but they don't have the, you know, the thigh creases, the lighter knee patch, the things like that, um, because your, your rinse washing typically doesn't do that. You have to go on and give it a stone wash or a sand wash, uh, in addition to, to, to something like that. Okay, guys, that concludes, um, our first part. We're going to come back next week and uh, talk a little bit more about our fab uh, cotton fabrics. There is uh, certainly plenty I didn't get uh, the chance to talk about today. We'll talk about our knits and our, our sort of uh, piled fabrics and our specialty weaves and all that fun stuff. So I will see you next week to talk more about cotton. Uh, have a great weekend and I'll see you then. Bye-bye.